Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Virginia Lado Wisan. I'm head of conservation and collection care at the Bodleian, but also uh, secretary of defense of the Bodleian for now a year and a bit. Of it. I don't remember exactly the bit, but um, it is my pleasure today to see such a full, such a full room, but also to introduce my colleague and, and good friend, Nick Milley. Nick Milley and I have been working uh, closely on the conservation and, um, and history research of the Sheldon Tapestry maps, and that's how we got to know each other a little more uh, since 22, oops, sorry, did I do something else? <laughs> 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 since, 20, since 2012. Mm, this is gonna play me. <laughs> um, Nick is map librarian here at the Bodleian since 1992. He's also been map curator at the University of Sussex, and he's a fellow of the Royal Cartographical Society. He has been a council member of the British Cartographic Society since 20, uh, 2004 until 2009. He's a member of the Brick Mix, and he's the chairman of this same uh, institution since 2017. Nick has organized uh, several exhibitions, amongst which in 1995 he organized all at Sea, the story of navigational charts, an exhibition that celebrated 200 years of the hydrographic office. He, in, 19, in 2003, he organized street mapping and A to Z of urban cartography. And this year, as you know, he's curating Talking Maps, our star show at the moment, which you can actually see until March 2019, um, 2020, sorry. Um, Nick will be talking to us about how this exhibition came to be, so how it was structured, how it was created, how the objects that you see on display made it to the actual display, a selection amongst a very large collection of very wonderful maps that we have here at the Bodleian. So how can we select and, and, and just reject some of the items that, that we have that are actually fascinating too? So Nick is going to tell you about that. It is a little bit of a trip behind the scenes of the making of talking maps, which I hope you enjoy very much. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you, everybody, for coming along. It's a real pleasure to see you all. And uh, yeah, talking maps, cartographic conversations from the Bodleian's exhibition. I was talking about this at home and what, this morning. We were thinking, How's it going to work? And we thought, you know, what we're going to see today is pretty much the director's cut or the curator's cut, if you like, of the whole exhibition. Because I've been giving a number of talks about talking maps, and some of you, I realise, in the audience will have been to some of these before. And we'll recognise quite a lot of this, but there are a few different bits in here. What didn't make it rather than what did make it? Now, Virginia very kindly mentioned the two previous map exhibitions that I've been involved in here. And I've been rather keen on having another map exhibition for some time. And we eventually <coughs> received the green light from the exhibitions committee in 2015. It was more of an amber light. Um, I was told, not really told, but recommended to find an external curator a non Bodleian curator to work with me on this, and also to come up with a kind of business plan, if you like, or a plan for an exhibition which would attract a wide audience. So I trotted off, went away, and thought, who am I going to find who could be a co curator with me? And straight away, I thought of my colleague Jerry Broughton, uh, Professor of Renaissance Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, that doesn't sound particularly promising for a map exhibition, but Jerry is a map man, and he's written extensively on maps, and he also happens to live just around the corner in North Oxford, so very, very convenient. So I, I contacted Jerry and said, look, I'm looking for a, a co-curator for this exhibition. Um, what do you think? And he said, when do we start? So he was on board straight away. It couldn't have been easier. And so we spent many long fruitful, happy hours discussing maps and cartography in the Banugo Cafe outside, trying to find a theme which would bring everything together. Now, Jerry's mapping ideas and my cartographic ideas are very, very different. 
So straight away, we had a problem as to what we were going to talk about, what sort of mapping we wanted. And this is the Bodleian Library. You have to have the Goth map. You have to have the Selden map. There's lots of other maps you have to have in an exhibition. But how can you get them all together? How can you bring them all together? And then there was this wonderful light bulb moment over a very fine um, pastry in the cafe when we came up with talking maps. We can get maps to talk to each other. We can get maps to talk to us. Maps tell stories. They have to tell stories. It's what they're all about. So this is what we decided we could pin the exhibition around. This would be our theme. And we could include any map we wanted. Perfect, perfect. So that's where we started off from. Um, this is very much where we finished off in a way. When it all of a sudden became very, very real. This picture is taken from the front seat of the top deck of the park and ride bus at uh, <laughs> Oxford Parkway Station. Uh, I don't often use the park and ride bus, as many of you will know, and on occasion I had to use it. And there I was, and I looked out the window and saw that. And then I realised we had arrived. We were a destination. We were talking maps. So, what about it? Here's a chance to talk about, or to get maps talking, but we've got one and a half million maps to choose from. Which ones do we pick? Our theory is, or our premise is, every map tells a story, and our focus was very much on the stories the maps were telling, as much as the map's history. And I think, for those of you interested, and Richard mentioned the books on sale outside, that is very much what's going on in both books. And the maps are graphic representations facilitating spatial understanding of things, concepts, conditions, processes and events in the human world. So, how about that? And also, our range of maps and supporting materials have enabled us to pursue the exhibition's aim of educating, engaging, entertaining and enriching visitors' experience. So we rather hope that that's the way of things. So, that's where we set off. And very quickly, we had an idea as to what was going into the exhibition. But one thing that missed the exhibition, we got everything laid out, and then we were doing a bit of an audit on some atlases which we didn't think had been catalogued correctly. And this cropped up. Maps that talk, wouldn't that have been brilliant? It missed the cut. Now, unfortunately, it's only a tiny thing, so it wouldn't have been that exciting. But we saw that and thought, if only. That cartographically, not very interesting. It's a map of Middlesex. You can see London down here. But it was just the title that really did work for us. And we thought, well, that's vindicated our choice of uh, exhibition uh, subject matter. It shows that it really is the case. So, talking maps. It's structured around 10 cases. I'm guessing you're all familiar with the exhibition room next door. Um, and each of the cases we decided to focus on a specific theme and what we've done is put maps in the cases uh, fair enough but what we had to do about two years before the exhibition opened was walk around because the cases are static and some maps are very large so we had to work out which of our large maps could live in which cases and then build stories around that and find out what we could have to support those maps We've also, other than maps, we have letters, we have film, we have scientific <coughs> instruments, photographs and sound recordings, all connected to the talking map story. And the ten cases roughly look at the sea. We have one section called Out of This World. We have a bit of orientation. We have the goth map, of course. We have imaginary plots, the land, the country, war, Oxford, and worlds on the move. And I'll, I'll be looking at some of these in some detail, but by no means all of them. And that's two years ago was the ground plan that we had. So you usually come in here from Blackwell Hall and walk around. Um, there's no real order to the exhibition. You can take it in whichever order you like. But what I thought I'd do is just focus on a few of the cases and give you an idea as to what you might expect to find in there or perhaps what you might not seen there, which you would have hoped to have seen. So we'll begin with imaginary maps, and Jerry, being a professor of um, English literature, Renaissance studies, he's very much literature, and he 
wanted to explore the word plot, which is essential for what we've done and the story we're telling. So there are two real definitions of plot in the Oxford English Dictionary. Firstly, a ground plan, a map, a nautical chart, and later also a representation on a chart of the movements of a ship or aircraft. So it's very much a mappy feel to this. Um, in 1551, to draw the plot of any country that you shall come in as justly as may be. And from 1579 to 80, Hannibal drew a plot of the city and caused it to be built and inhabited. So there's the first angle on plot. The second definition, the plan or scheme of a literary or dramatic work, the main events of a play, novel, film, opera, etc., considered or presented as an interrelated sequence, a storyline, also in extended use. And here we have two examples from 1613. The plot of our play lies contrary and twill hazard the spoiling of our play. Or from 1647, we do entreat that you would not expect strange turns and windings in the plot. So here we've got literature, cartography, mixed together, and what better an example than Treasure Island. This is Robert Louis Stevenson's map of Treasure Island, but the story here is a little more interesting. Stevenson drew his map of Treasure Island first, and then wrote the story based entirely on what his map showed. He sent both map and story off to his publisher, and the publisher lost the map. Never to be seen again. So Stevenson had to draw a second Treasure Island, which is, whoops, I've gone too far, which is this one here. Um, there's his second Treasure Island. And throughout, ever since Treasure Island was published, he always had this nagging doubt that it was never his Treasure Island. It was a second Treasure Island. It wasn't quite right. It didn't quite match the story. So here we have a bit of cartography and a bit of literature, and we'll do a little bit more. We'll go on to a couple, well, one, one talking map of the Hornberg Fortress. Um, we decided to go with a talking map, given the success of last year's talking show. Um, but this one didn't appear in the show. So we deliberately chose one that hadn't been seen before. And the beauty of this one, which you don't really see in the exhibition, here is the map, the fortress is there. It very much has a feel of a Wainwright map to me, for those of you familiar with walking in the Lake District, in that you um, get both a, a planimetric and a, an oblique view of the landscape. But it's what's on the back, which we don't show in the exhibition. This is a more detailed view of Helm's Deep, this point here. But it's the text, and the text is a 1942 examination paper from one of Tolkien's students, which he's just written on the back. Uh, it's <laughs> I just wonder who that poor student was. And the, the, the fact that cartographically, um, Tolkien was a magnificent map maker. Um, it's a, a wonderful manuscript map. So I've shown you a couple of literary works which made it to the exhibition. But we thought long and hard about whether we should include this map of Ambridge. Uh, there are quite a few maps of Ambridge in the Bodleian map collection. This is one of them. Uh, it looks like a map. It feels like a map. It's obviously not a real place. What I love about this, though, uh, is down the right-hand side are all these advertisements for local services in and around the Ambridge area. Uh, the map is... Uh, I brought it along. It's on our map trolley over there, so you can have a look if you're interested. But it just has the feel of a standard town plan. It's all quite detailed and you can see references to all your favourite characters. Um, and another one which didn't make it was um, the island of Sodor for all the Thomas the Tank Engine fanatics. And I have to bear in mind that when I was a child, I, was, uh, I read these every day. But cartographically, what makes it so wonderful? Does anyone know where the Isle of Sodor is supposed to be? Because this map tells you exactly. This is Barrow in Furness, and that's the Isle of Man. And the inset there shows you where the island is. So it's up in the northeast of the Irish Sea. 
and you can see all the railway lines, all the settlements, all the action from the books. So, um, and it's out on the front here if you want to have a look. So we'll move on from there, um, and we'll move to a particular favourite of mine, which is Laxton. Now, some of you will know about Laxton, but maybe not all of you. This is what the Laxton map dates from 1635, and it's an estate map from eastern Nottinghamshire. Uh, it's very close to Newark on Trent. So there's a, a map showing you where it is. Newark, the River Trent, Nottingham, Lincoln. That's the sort of general area we're in. I'll just flip back. And what we see here are effectively two villages. Whoops. So there's a line running down here, which is the border. And on this side is the village of Laxton. And down here is the village of Kneesall. Now, for those unfamiliar with Laxton, I'll just introduce it gently for you. You can see there are thousands and thousands of strips indicated on this map. The surveyor was a chap called Mark Pierce, and he wandered around the area, making sure that he'd mapped every single strip of land that was farmed. So it's very much feudal England and how the landscape was farmed. So we've seen where it is. This is what it looks like because Laxton is the only place in the country which didn't enclose. It is still farmed using the strip system. So you can see quite clearly all these strips in the landscape. They don't quite match the strips of the map because um, as time has moved on, agricultural machinery has got considerably larger and there are problems of access to the land. And so strips have been consolidated, but by and large, they're still there. Now, the street pattern, the road pattern, there's an sort of east-west and then a north-south road, and there's a little village green here, there's the church, uh, there's the, the dove pit in there, but there's virtually no building in the fields at all. Let's just zoom in a little more. But the wonder of the Laxton map is that every single strip has its own unique identifying number. So there's number 118, 119, and they tend to run in sequence, 79, 80. You can't see them all, some have faded. But you can deduce which strip is which, the number of which, which strip is which, which is important. And it's important because not only do we have the map, but we have the terrier to go with it. And this wonderful document, with all the numbers down the side, it tells you which individual is farming each single strip and it tells you how large the strip is. So they are minute by and large, the acreages. So the left hand figure is the acreage of the plot and then subdivisions therein. We also have individuals listed. So these are individual tenant farmers <laughs> and it tells you how much land they farm in the village. And what we've done in Talking Maps is focus on this chap here, Robert Ross. And we've mapped out where his strips are across Laxton. So you can see that he was having to travel a huge distance. He had, I think, about 30 different strips that he was farming within the village. Um, the furthest one was about five kilometres from his home. But more of the story of Laxton can be revealed in this rather faint cartouche, um, which describes it as a plat and description and tells us more about how it came about, who commissioned it, etc., etc. But for me, and the cartographic angle, what I find interesting is what's going on around the edge. And it's this little fella here, who I am convinced is Mark Pierce, who is the cartographer. You can see him, he's got a map in his hand. If you look carefully, that is the Laxton map, without a doubt. You can see that it, the fields outlined there are the fields which Pierce has mapped. And he's also at it again. Here he is drawing his map. Um, he's writing a description of it. And there he is wandering the fields with a version of the map in his hands. So I mean, it tells us a little bit about what Pierce was up to, what he did. But Laxton continues to enthrall and entertain and inform. Anybody remember this from last year? Your chance to be lord of a medieval manor for only seven million pounds. The estate was up for sale. And our map appeared 
in all the publicity released by Carter Jonas. There you are. There's the town sign for that, or the village sign. There's an aerial view. And there's our map. Slap bang in the middle. Uh, the sale is yet to go through, although I think it's fairly imminent from talking to people in Laxton. What I have to say is that the library in Laxton have a wonderfully wonderful close relationship. We are expecting a visit from the villagers of Laxton, I think in a fortnight's time, to come and have a look at their map in the exhibition. Uh, one of the Laxton villagers we filmed and he stars in the exhibition. He also runs their um, local history centre and he's a farmer as well. So he describes how the system works, how the farming system works, which is really impressive. So you can go and listen to uh, Stuart Rose in action if you go into the exhibition. And just to show how serious the library is in um, extending its links with Laxton Village. Look at these likely lads. This is the Bodleian cricket team. On one of the very rare occasions, it travelled away from Oxford and won a game. But we did win. Um, so uh, th that's me there. You'll recognise Stuart from the map section. I'm sure most of you know Martin Kaufman. Um, and there are various other um, regular looking, you probably know Mike Webb but there's lots of other people on that picture who you may well recognise from your time in the library. Um, and the Laxton team are there as well. So, just to show a bit of outreach there as far as the library is concerned, but we'll move on to East-West links now. And we, we wanted to challenge our um, visitors to how they perceive the world, whether they view it as north or south at the top of the map, east or west at the top of the map. And this is... a a map of Mundi, it's, a tiny, it's only about this big, um, from I think it's the 14th century, it's a map of the world, and it's got a very, very Christian take. Um, the Garden of Eden is right up here in the east, um, down here is the Straits of Gibraltar, we have the Mediterranean, the River Nile, and the River Don, around which the map of traditional Christian world mapping in the Middle Ages was based upon. So it's called a TO map. So there's your T, there's your O, Asia at the top, Europe and Africa here, and down here are the British Isles. So bear that in mind, try and memorise that, and we'll go for something with a different cultural heritage. We'll go for maps made in the Islamic world. This is a Persian map of the world. This is the Arabian Peninsula. This is Europe here. This is Africa. Asia, south at the top, and here's Al Idris's world map, Arabian Peninsula, a bit more easy to see what's going on, there's Sicily, there's Spain, Italy, got the River Nile here, um, mount, chains of mountains, we've got rivers, all very interesting. Um, what we've done, one of the great ways that we've tried to communicate and bring Al Idris's work to life, I don't know how many of you have been to the exhibition, but what we're rather thrilled with is the recreation of Ali Idrisi's silver disc. Now, Idrisi was commissioned by Roger II, the Norman king of uh, Sicily, to create a silver disc. Um, in his, and this was certainly in Roger's hands by 1154. But unfortunately, there was a rebellion in Sicily. The disc was captured and it was melted down. No one knows what it looks like. But our friends at the Factum Foundation in Madrid, we've been working with them for a number of years in the map section, and we said, can you reimagine the silver disc? And they said, of course we can. <laughs> and there it is. It's just outside, the other side of this wall. And this is my co-curator, Jerry Broughton. Um, the lighting has been a bit of a challenge, but it's getting better and better. Um, round here is the source of the Nile, and it flows down there. Britain is behind Jerry, but you can see Britain, if you know what to look like, it looks nothing like Britain at all, but it, it's there. And there's a lovely film outside that Factum have produced, it's about a five minute long film, explaining how they converted a series of maps in a book to something like this. So lots of little rectangles, all of a sudden made, circle, made circular. It's rather wonderful, so do take a look. And we'll move on to a bit of Oxford. We've got to have some Oxford. And this is another map that doesn't make it. Curator's Cut number four. It's a standard ordnance survey map from the 1930s. Um, here's the Northern Bypass. Banbury Road is coming down here. Um, not very interesting. We'll zoom in a bit. 
bodily place is there, but that's not what we want to talk about on this one. Okay? Bodily place. What we want to talk about are what look very much like cartographic errors. There's a little line there, and there's a little line there. There's some knowing guffaws in the audience. Let's zoom in a bit more. There and there. And what we're looking at is the cartographic manifestation of the Cutslow Walls, the notorious wall. This, this appeared in 1934 and didn't come down until 1959. Um, for those of you familiar with the story, we have the wonderful help of a map which we've borrowed from Oxford City Council, a map which was produced in 1934, just after the walls went up. Doesn't look like much, but it tells a very interesting story. Here's the northern bypass up here, here's the Cutslow Roundabout and Banbury Road. The pink area is the private housing which went up first. The yellow area is the housing that went up later, built by Oxford City Council to accommodate those people moved out of the city centre in the slum clearance moves. The walls are these two red lines here. The walls were erected by the people living here. Um, effectively stopping access from the yellow area direct to Banbury Road. The City Council thought this was appalling and started to pull the walls down. Um, they were taken to court and lost and had to rebuild the walls. Um, a Canadian tank on exercises in the Second World War was motoring along one of these roads, saw the wall, ploughed right through it. The War Office had to rebuild. And it was only when... Um, compulsory purchase, Oxford City Council bought the land on which the walls stand that they were able, in 1959, to demolish them. But what this map does is the blue lines, or the blue arrows, measure the distance from the west side of the wall to, there are a couple of bus stops on Banbury Road, there's also a school down here, and the yellow lines measure the distance from the east side. So if we pick this one here, this bus stop here, it's 385 yards if you walk along there. If you go up this way, it's 1,075 yards. So, what, three times as far. Which is quite something. Let's just zoom in a bit, and there you can see it in more detail. Um, so, quite an inconvenience. What is of interest, for those of you who are familiar with the area, you'll know, know that the road names change. So that's one road, and then it becomes Woolsey Road. This is Aldrich Road, which I think is Wentworth Road. I, I get them mixed up. But um, it's very clear to identify where the wall was just by the building styles. And again, like Laxton, Cutslow came into the news last year when the City Council was resurfacing the roads. And here you see... Wentworth Road, and this I think is Aldrich Road here, only Wentworth Road was resurfaced. Um, there's the blue plaque marking the site of the walls, and class war has appeared painted on the road. I think this is a genuine mistake, and it's just the database of roads um, managed by the City Council, and it was the turn of Wentworth Road to be resurfaced. But the story won't go away. But there are plenty of other maps of Oxford which could have made the story. This one got in, it wasn't a Bodleian map, but it's such a good story. So we had to cut out Hoggar's uh, wonderful 1850 map of Oxford, which is just stunningly beautiful, but it's massive. It's huge. I did bring it along today, but there's nowhere really to put it out because it's on four great big sheets. But you could look at that for a level of detail. And another big Oxford map that didn't make it was the Soviet map from 1973, which is out there. Um, we've compromised, and you'll see there's a bit of a film, and you can see there's the Soviet map of the Medway Towns gets onto that. That's quite an interesting map for various nerdy cartographic reasons and how they deal with bridges over major rivers. But, yeah, there's the Radcliffe camera, and here you can see Broad Street. For those of you unfamiliar with Soviet mapping of Britain, I'm going to mention it a little bit. I'll mention it towards the end of the talk, to, uh, but hopefully that just whets your appetite. We go on to the sea. This is a Portaland chart, um, which appears in an atlas. We have Venice down here. This is the Adriatic Sea. Sicily up there. Um, 
Again, late 1400s, but what these charts were designed to do was uh, well, permit safe navigation at sea. So you could <laughs> plot a course if you were in Venice and, say, wanted to go to Dubrovnik, somewhere like that. You could plot a course using this chart and you would get there, you'd get close. It won't give you the, the details of sandbanks and shoals right on the coastline, but you will get in the general direction. That's one way of doing it. But if you were sailing in the South Pacific, um, the Marshall Islands, for example, you might want to use this, which is a stick chart. Um, the white shells represent the islands and the sticks represent ocean currents or the swells at sea. And how these operated would be your navigator wouldn't take this to sea, but they would sit at the front of the canoe, they would memorise all these water patterns, and they would watch the water, and they would navigate accordingly. What you need to know is that these shells represent islands. The islands are sufficiently distant that you cannot see from one to another with the naked eye. So we're talking about serious distances out at sea. Another way to look at seas is this from the Book of Curiosities, originally dating from somewhere between 1020 and 1050. This is the Mediterranean. Hard to believe, I know. Um, we have 121 ports with red dots. And in true Eric Morkham style, we have 118 islands here, all the right islands, but not necessarily in the right order. Um, that's Sicily, this is Cyprus, but the rest are the rest of the Medi ma major Mediterranean islands. The ports are actually in reasonable order. Um, down here are the Egyptian ports. This map was made in Egypt. Straight to Gibraltar here, Constantinople is one of these. So, is it a sea chart? You couldn't navigate with it. Absolutely hopeless. But if you were going hopping from port to port, then it has a use. So there's examples of three vaguely nautical things. One which didn't make the cut, and there are debates about whether this is a map or not, is this one from the Marconi collection. Um, it's identifying where ships are at sea when the Titanic went down. This is a Titanic here, and the, the Titanic's course is plotted. So everything moving this way is moving from Europe to North America, Everything moving this way is moving from North America to Europe. So what you'll see is time and individual dates across the top. And then down the side are latitudes. So telling you where in the sea you can expect, um, sorry, it's longitude, where you can expect the ships to be. It takes a while to work out what's going on. You need to look at it long and hard, but very quickly you can realise what would be close to the Titanic at the appropriate moment. So this chart is created before the Titanic went down because it does have a projected arrival time in New York. So it's an interesting thing. Um, and it's spatial, so it is probably cartographic. We'll just look at a bit of wartime mapping. It's not really wartime mapping. It's a bit of a cheat, but I think you'll enjoy this. This is some aerial photography which was flown just after the Second World War. And the beauty of it is that all these photos cover exactly the same geographical area as an Ordnance Survey six inch map. Now again, that's very nerdy map speak, but I'll show you what I mean in a moment. This is Slough up here. Heathrow is about here. The M25 currently runs around here. So that's getting you familiar with where we are. These maps were available on open sale and very quickly the people selling the maps realised that most people buying these things couldn't speak English very well. <laughs> the, one of the beauties of being a legal deposit library is that we get all of these. We've got them all. Unfortunately, not all the country was covered, but a significant por portion was. So it was deemed that these were still of so much importance that second editions so, should be published. So here's the second edition. Have a close look. I see a lot of nodding. That's good. Because there's an aircraft factory up here. There isn't here. And what's happened is 
that some fields have been superimposed to conceal the aircraft factory. Let's just go in a bit closer. There's the aircraft factory. You can see there are little planes down here. Very much an aircraft factory. Not anymore. Isn't that clever? Um, you can always tell. One of the beauties of just wading through our collection is if you see a little V or if you see a sheet with the same number as another one, you, see, you know there's going to be something odd going on. This is how the Ordnance Survey portrayed exactly the same area. And they've gone with the B edition. Complete blank. Nothing on the map at all. When you see lots of blanks on an Ordnance Survey map of this level of detail, you know there's something odd. There's something fishy going on. I'll give you an example of a low-spec version of this redaction method. Um, and this is out on the front here. This is an area near Bedworth in Warwickshire. And this is the area I want you to pay attention to. The cheap version, the version where you don't superimpose new fields, is where cotton wool takes over. And you get the same place on a cloudy day. <coughs> Ingenious. So those really are the maps I want to focus on. Um, I think we said in the blurb that we'd be travelling, this exhibition travels from the afterlife, and there's an example, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Is that a map? It's certainly an image showing a journey onwards after death towards the afterlife. This describes how you get there and what you encounter. So we were going to talk from the afterlife to the Twitter sphere. And what we have here is Donald Trump's tweets. Have a close look at it because we have about 450 maps like this in the exhibition. It's what's known as a cartogram. Every country of the world is mapped according to its statistical value. This, ladies and gentlemen, is North Korea. <laughs> Here is Mexico, quite big. Puerto Rico, quite big. Australia, quite small. Much of Africa, largely ignored. By the t when this had been created for us, the Greenland story hadn't got going. <laughs> so I dare say that nowadays Greenland will look much larger. But it is just a fascinating take and a different subject matter we've got on here. Uh, we've been working very closely with a colleague at the University of Iceland and He's done this marvellous statistical analysis of migration to and from about 140 different countries. So you can choose a country, click on it. If you want to find out Belgium and the Philippines, they're two that we haven't managed to find the data for. We've been fiddling around in the, in the gallery and that's not in. But if you click on it, then you can see where people are travelling to and from. It's, it's good stuff. So, what are we doing? We're taking the exhibition on a series of seven roadshows around Oxfordshire Public Libraries, talking about it. The first one is this Thursday, where we're going to be in the Westgate Library, um, just talking about maps along with our colleagues from um, uh, the County Library Service, which we're looking forward to. Um, we're doing various schools-based events, getting schools in to look at the exhibition, a series of public talks, lectures and workshops. Well, this is one of them. Uh, we do three lunchtime guided tours per week. Now, these, this is a new move, and every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at one o'clock, there will be a guest celebrity speaker or whoever, somebody, member of library staff, the cartographic expert, who just turn up, and they will guide you through certain parts of the talking maps, which is relevant to them. It might be just one map or one case, but you never know what you're going to get, but it will be good. Um, we managed to get the newly restored Sheldon Tapestry map out, so uh, something that Virginia and I have worked long and hard on, and it's really great to see it, so have a look at that. And we're also hoping to recreate the Lux Moralis light show on the 16th of November. I don't know if any of you saw this last year as part of the Oxford um, Light Festival. We got the last slot on the Sunday evening, so it's very cold. It was about 7 o'clock. A lot of people had gone home, but it's pictures and music beamed onto the old school squad. It was stunningly good. Um, we're hoping that we'll get a much, well, we are getting a much earlier slot on the Saturday this year, so I would definitely recommend you come and see that. Other things we're doing, a series of talking maps, um, lunchtime lectures. The next one is one which is relevant to the Friends of the Bodleian. 
It's Alexander Kent and John Davies, Secret Soviet Maps of Britain and the World. The Friends of the Bodleian years ago were very, very generous in supporting a massive acquisition of Soviet maps from all around the world, which we were able to get in as soon as people realised they were available. Um, in 1993, um, they were displayed at a cartographic conference in Cologne, and no one in the West had seen these things before. And fairly soon after that, we just... Well, we spent a lot of money thanks to the friends and they've been incredibly useful ever since, certainly for countries like Turkey, China, India, Greece, difficult countries for getting mapping. And then even for the UK, some very, very detailed town plans, well worth looking at. And what else? There are books. 50 maps and talking maps. Jerry and I were signed up by Bodleian Library Publishing to do a, a book to go with the exhibition. This is Talking Maps and we probably finished it about 18 months before the exhibition was due to open and then we were told oh this the second book um when are you going to finish that and we both looked at each other and said the second book and um <laughs> well the second book book 50 maps actually finished before talking maps in the end that's uh where we just selected 50 maps most of which are featured in the exhibition although not all um so there's the cover of 50 maps which we rather like. This map does appear in the exhibition. It's not what you think. Go and have a close look. It looks like a map of Tyneside. It isn't. Um, it's a great thing. And there's Jerry and I showing off talking maps um, with the, the Grayson, one of the two Grayson Perry maps that uh, we're using uh, in the exhibition. That's red carpet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have time for. So thank you very much. Thank you.